Well, hello and welcome to the Country Club, UN Country Club. This is Dan Purcell, and I'm fortunate to have with me today Dan Geddes of the Satirist.com. And uh, uh, yesterday he gave an excellent presentation over at the uh, Princeton Club here in New York City on the satire in the global village. I'm real happy to have him here today. Uh, Dan was born in Cleveland, but he now lives in Amsterdam. So uh, he's here, uh, here in uh, New York City today. Yeah, like I mentioned, we were over at the Princeton Club. The Princeton Club is near the Harvard Club and the Yale Club. The three Ivy League clubs are all right here together in uh, New York City within blocks of each other. They're just a few blocks of Grand Central Terminal and also within a few blocks of the Financial District on uh, Park Avenue. Um, Yale has the biggest of all. They have not notable people as their members, such as Bill and Hillary Clinton, the Bushes, one and two, and so on and so forth. Yale uh, claims to have the biggest clubhouse, private clubhouse in the world, comprising 22 stories and a worldwide membership of over 11,000, the largest private clubhouse worldwide. And they're just up from Wall Street, but they've been around a long time. They're not Johnny Come Lately. They were organized in the late 1800s, so uh, something else. I uh, had a really good dinner there last night. I had some salmon. Uh, Dan, how was your dinner? It was really delicious. I had a really nice chicken, and the apple pie dessert was amazing, and the conversation was very stimulating as well. Well, great. Well, I'm going to start in with a stereotypical question, which a lot of a lot of Americans want to know, and maybe some other people that aren't familiar with Amsterdam and the Netherlands so much. What they always think about is kind of the, the free-flowing lifestyle in Amsterdam. And I have to ask, when uh, tourists visiting Amsterdam, do they go straight from the airport and go to Amsterdam uh, cafes and start smoking pot, or is that still available these days? Well, it's certainly available, and some Americans do that, but I mean, it's also more available in the States now, so a lot of the people, why would they go all the way to Amsterdam if they can go to Denver or Seattle but Amsterdam has a lot more to offer than that you know I mean it's really nice to be able to cycle everywhere it has great art museums it's a beautiful city with canals everywhere so it, it just has a lot to offer and so why did you choose to live in Amsterdam leave Cleveland well I got a job um, I didn't leave Cleveland for there but I, I was uh, born in Cleveland and raised there but uh, I lived in Washington for five years and uh, in 2001 I got an IT development job uh, in Amsterdam and I've been there ever since. Well that sounds great so uh, so how are things going at the satirist.com and your speech was on the uh, satire in the global village and that really applies to the UN Country Club over here the United Nations so uh, would you like to give an update on how things are going at the satirist I've had an opportunity to review it it's an absolutely great website with a lot of good satire. Well, thank you very much it's going really well we're getting a lot of great contributions now including from professors they, they need an outlet for their satire so more and more I'm getting more con contributions than I and my editorial staff can read so it's really a great time at the satirist.com and I'm happy to try to keep the spirit of satire Satire alive. How long have you been doing uh, Satirist? It started in 1999, so I consider it one of the web's longest running websites, and I was really happy even back then to get the domain. And over time, its readership has built, and it has a lot of uh, credibility from being such an old web domain. And uh, it gets a lot of links from Wikipedia and university sites, and some of it's taught in schools because it's a really credible source for satire and also literary criticism. Well, that's great. Well, I want to thank you for uh, being actually the first interview I have on UN Country Club. I was going to start with Matthew uh, Russell Lee over at Inner City Press at the UN. The general session is going on at the United Nations right now, and it's very busy over there. They've had the Pope, the President, presidents from all kinds of countries, including Cuba, Brazil, uh, all over. I think he's stuck behind the barriers, the food trucks, the catering trucks, the police, the Homeland Security, Secret Service, NYPD. So hopefully he, uh, I think it ends here coming up, hopefully he can dig himself out and come and join us here on UN Country Club. I'm sure he'll be here soon. But thank you for being here today. But you covered a lot of issues that were really germane to the international community and, and, uh, and also the U.S.'s role in the United Nations. You covered a whole variety of topics, and so maybe you can go into some of these now. Um, I'm going to talk first about it. Andrew Keene, he was the keynote speaker at the event, um, he has uh, published the book, uh, Internet is Not the Answer, uh, uh, basically saying that uh, the Internet isn't all it's built to be. What did you think about Andrew Keene's comments about the Internet? 
Well, I agreed with a lot of it. I mean, basically what he was trying to do was deflate the idea that the Internet is solving all these problems and that it's only a good thing. He was trying to point out the dark side of it, you know, that uh, if you look at old industries that used to employ hundreds of thousands of people, now in Internet industries you can have multi-billion dollar companies with just a few people. So all that wealth is not being spread to a middle class. It's going to a few Silicon Valley billionaires. And that's not necessarily going to help other people. And he also talked a lot about the original idealism behind Silicon Valley and the Internet and how it was going to lead to more democratization and things like that. But that isn't necessarily the case either because the Internet has also become, as he put it, a panopticon where there's a surveillance state and we're all essentially being watched. And people know that. But because it is so cool and fun to be connected all the time, most people are willing to uh, accept that trade-off. Well, that's interesting. One thing he mentioned was uh, WhatsApp selling for, uh, I think, $20 billion. They have something like 45 or 50 employees or something like that. Um, that's a lot. Well, you covered a lot of really, uh, oh, I should comment right now. We were fortunate enough, fortunate or unfortunate enough here. We're at the New York Public Library, the Schwartzman Public Library here in New York City, the main library. But today is Pulaski Day in New York City. It's the uh, for Poland. We have the Polish parade going on behind us. And it's going to start. Looks like it's starting right now. We have a marching band coming through. We've got, looks like NYPD marching band is going to lead off the parade yeah, here. here We've got, oh, there goes Chuck Schumer. Let's wave to Chuck Schumer. Hi, Senator Schumer there. Meet Chuck Schumer. Okay, well, looks like we missed uh, Chuck Schumer there. He's behind us. Um, well, that's good. Oh, there they go, the sirens. But you covered a lot of interesting things. You covered artificial intelligence, the book 1984, George Orwell's, George Orwell's 1984. The NSA, you have some comments about the NSA's role in, and then the way they do and people's reaction to them, almost a condition you mentioned, and uh, free speech, Disney, Trans-Pacific Partnership, and those. Um, well, would you like to cover any of those? How about artificial intelligence? Well, a lot about artificial intelligence that's interesting is the fact that uh, more and more uh, social theorists are predicting that robots or AI systems are going to replace a lot of jobs. Oxford a few months ago published a study that said by 2025, something like 50% of the jobs in the U.S. could be automated away. So that's one really scary aspect about AI and artificial intelligence. But another, another one is people are predicting the singularity, and the, and the greatest spokesman of the singularity is uh, Ray Kurzweil, and he's uh, got a huge job at Google, and he's really helping Google work on this. And uh, if you don't know what the singularity is, that's the moment in Kurzweil's theory where, uh, where robots or artificial intelligence actually surpass human intelligence. And they're, they're saying this is inevitable. Uh, and not everybody agrees with that. But if you look at Moore's Law of Computing, where every two years, computer power, every 18 months, actually, computer power doubles, uh, if that trend keeps going, if, if you extrapolate it, that, in fact, does seem possible. I mean, maybe they won't write good poems, but they'll be able to take most of the jobs that we do. And one of the things I wanted to ask Andrew Keen, but I didn't get a chance, was uh, what is, what's going to happen if 50% uh, of the jobs go away? Is there going to be a real decline in standard of living? Or many European theorists are hoping that the governments will know that they'll have to put in something like a guaranteed minimum income. Because otherwise, how are people ever going to make a living if so many jobs, blue collar jobs, union jobs are just gone? Yeah, someone mentioned us uh, that was at the dinner uh, a couple of nights ago. She mentioned the hotel business that you can book book your room online. You never communicate with anyone. You go there, you can check in online. You go to your room basically with your cell phone, and then even room service would be. Uh, you know, there are robots now that basically bring your room service to you, almost cutting out all those uh, hotel workers. And you think in the case of a McDonald's or something, well, they exactly. would become. Yeah, yeah. I did a stand-up routine once about the robot burger chefs. There's already a burger that can cook. I don't know, like. Oh, it's like 60 burgers a second, I think, because they do it in a layered process. So, yeah, people struck to get uh, $15 an hour wages in the fast food industry, but I'm afraid that's probably going to only last for a few years because due to the efficiencies of the robot burger chefs, I think we're going to see more and more automated jobs. But it's not just fast food. There was an excellent article a few months ago, I think, in The Atlantic, and they talked about truck driving jobs. When the Google self-driving jobs... Uh, sorry, Google self-driving cars really get going well, and this is also thought to be inevitable. All the truck driving companies are going to put in automated truck drive, automated trucks, the truck driving jobs, and that's the most common job in many states is truck driving. 
So that'll go away. And not only that, but the whole economies or ecosystems around that. The truck stops, the gas stations, the hotels, the restaurants, all these things, the country music, <laughs> all these things could go away uh, if we just have uh, the, the automated cars. And it's, it's really everything, medicine, law, accounting. There's really not that many fields that are going to be immune to the effects of artificial intelligence. Yeah, you're absolutely right in terms of that automation. Uh, uh, the freight carriers, the FedExes, the UPSs of the world, they can benefit but also be uh, hurt in some ways. Uh, Amazon, uh, well, we've got some fire trucks behind us, but uh, Amazon.com uh, is planning to use drones to deliver their packages. They want to do a million packages a day. They figure they can get the costs down to $2 or even a dollar a delivery. That would cut out FedEx, UPS. But FedEx and UPS may go to um, automated delivery trucks. They may go to self-piloting planes. Um, one thing about the drones is kind of a side item. It's a little bit scary. There are a couple of states in the U.S. where their legislatures have already passed the ability to use these drones, these uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, to actually shoot um, uh, uh, people with rubber bullets and uh, bean bags and stuff. Fleeing suspects. Yeah, that's right. The fact that they've already passed laws saying that's okay is showing where this is going. It really could become a kind of science fiction nightmare. You know, and if people are guilty of crimes, that's one thing, but they still shouldn't be hunted down like dogs by drones uh, but I'm afraid because of the economies of scale or the efficiencies of this it almost seems inevitable unless people wake up and try to do something to stop it we're gonna lose our very humanity well the UN does have drones they use them in other countries they haven't been necessarily efficient about it there have been complaints about uh, kind of waste and they're not not top of the line they can't fly in the rain and different things but the UN headquarters actually has has uh, the small UAVs flying around the headquarters over there they they land over at uh, Roosevelt Island and take off so I've seen them buzzing around um, you have uh, uh, which brings in the topic of the NSA and uh, mass surveillance I was at a uh, great press conference the other day where Glenn Greenwald and Edward Snowden were piped in live and talking about the Snowden Treaty and uh, um, uh, Glenn Greenwald's partner, uh, David Miranda, was pitching this treaty to protect whistleblowers and such. But you've talked about the way society has uh, kind of has a condition, the way they've, they've dealt with the, the NSA syndrome, so to speak. Yeah, I wrote an article about that, a satire, and I also did a stand-up routine about it called The Five Stages of NSA Surveillance Grief, because it's what I personally felt. Everybody knows about the five stages of death and dying, but I think we went through a similar process when we learned about Snowden's revelations and the and the NSA. I mean, first we were in a denial stage where we couldn't really believe it was happening because how could the government really be having that much information about everybody? And then there was an anger phase where we were really upset about it. We accepted it that it was true, but we were so upset that our long-standing privacy rights had been uh, uh, usurped. And then we went through sort of a bargaining phase where we're like, okay, well, they're going to watch us, so i got to be careful what I do online. Maybe I won't watch porn or whatever you were doing that you didn't want other people to know about. And then finally, you know, a depression stage where you're just upset, and uh, that ultimately leads to the final phase acceptance, and I think that's where many people are now, you know. Um, it's like in 1984, the telescreens were out in the big, it was like a Times Square kind of vision of telescreens, but now we just helpfully carry them around in our pockets or in our hands all day doing the NSA's job for them, you know. Yeah, I always see people with their, their faces just buried in their phones. It's like, just get your face out of your phone for a little while, but that's okay. Um, you also talked about free speech and issues of that, and you brought up the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a big issue. I was living in Hawaii, and that was big out there. But uh, can you talk about some of the provisions of TPP and how that might affect free speech? Well, unfortunately, I don't know that much about it. It's been leaked, some of it, by WikiLeaks. I know that. But uh, I think part of it is, uh, I think, long-standing uh, norms about fair use of copyrighted material. There's, you know, you're allowed to comment on copyrighted material. That could be undermined as big media companies try to protect their, their own copyright. But for me, the most upsetting thing about the TPP that I'm aware of is just the fact that it's a secret deal and that members of Congress even, uh, you know, some of them, many of them aren't even allowed to see it unless they have a security clearance and it's been billed as a, uh, as a trade agreement, which sounds harmless enough. Well, depending how you look at it, if you think about the WTO and things like that, they might not seem so harmless to you. But, um, 
Yeah, I mean, to me, the scariest thing about it is I think it's going to be used by U.S. companies to uh, undermine, say, European-style regulation of medicine, of ge genetically modified foods, and really make the corporations our real masters. There's even supposed to be special courts where companies can sue governments for passing or enforcing uh, regulation that uh, undermines their profit margins. So. And at that point, we're really in a, in a corporatocracy. And uh, I just want to remind people that, you know, Mussolini's definition of fascism is when you have the merger of corporate and state power. And we certainly have that in the United States and in most of the Western world, if, if not in almost the entire world now. Well, that is what's happening. And I know from my experience at the United Nations, uh, it's really run by the United States. And uh, so it really it is the United States running the world, both militarily and through the U uh, United Nations Country Club. So uh, I think there are a couple other items we talked about, uh, the free speech and such. But um, is there any other things you'd like to add to share with uh, the community here today that you can think of? Well, I just want to remind people that it is important that if they want to live in a democracy, it's not only about receiving rights, but uh, there's always responsibilities that go with rights. And one of those responsibilities is staying informed and trying to take part in the democratic process. Because if, if people don't stay active, then long-standing norms are going to be abolished. And so many of the, of the rights we have, if you think about the 40-hour work week or uh, workplace protections, those all came from unions and, and direct action and strike. And uh, if people aren't willing to at least consider doing some of those things again, I think long over time, a lot of these rights are going to be eroded. And we really will be the frog in the frying pan where every year the water gets a little bit hotter, but we can't jump out of it until we've been boiled to death. Well, that's great. Dan Geddes of uh, uh, the Satirist.com. We're going to include his presentation he gave to the group called General Semantics. It was their annual dinner and awards and a lot of uh, papers that were presented there. And I'm going to include at the end of this video or a link to it, uh, his, his presentation, which was absolutely excellent. And uh, so, so, Dan, thank you for being with us today. And thank you for being with us today. I'll uh, conclude this uh this uh, show with maybe some shots of the uh, Pulaski Day Parade behind us, the, the Poland Parade, so you can get a better feel for what it was all about. Thanks again, Dan, and, and thank you for being here, and we'll My look forward to Dan. seeing you next time. My pleasure. Thank you.